Welcome to Annette on America. This is Annette Bybee, your host, recovering lawyer, single mom to two teens and a tween. And we are just about done with the semester and I'm wrapping up the subbing and happy to be done with that for a little while, a few weeks. And since Christmas is just a few days away, I thought, you know what? I don't want to talk politics this week. So I'm doing a little something different. I am speaking with two different singer-songwriters who have written and produced Christmas songs. So in this first segment, I have Jane Greaves, who also happens to be my sister. (laughs) And um, if you've listened to me for a while, you know that I've had her on before, but she wrote a Christmas song and it's a lot of fun. And so she's back. Hi, Jane. Hi, Annette. (laughs) Um, And Jane and I... um, lost a sister recently so this is kind of a difficult time in our family if you're friends with me on facebook you probably saw that so we lost one of our six siblings which is very strange to all of a sudden there's five of us now i wonder when people say how many kids in your family Um, i'm going to say there used to be six and there's now five i don't know what do you say jane um well it depends on how they ask the question you know there, I always say I'm the youngest of six, so I, there's no need to say <laughs> there's no need to say that now there's just five. Yeah, it's just weird. Like I never expected to lose a sibling, not until I was in my 70s or 80s. Um, I didn't think you know you expect to lose a parent, but not a sibling. And nope. uh, she was and a younger one at that, younger than me anyway. And so, yeah. like I will. I'm sure a lot of people out there are having a difficult difficult time around the holidays, especially. It's hard when you've lost somebody, especially when you lose them around the holidays. We lost a cousin around Thanksgiving 10 years ago. And so now every Thanksgiving, I think about Natalie. And every Christmas, I'm going to think about Sherry. And it's just, it's strange. Um, grief is a weird thing too, I've discovered. Like, I'll go for several hours like, oh, yeah, everything's normal. No biggie. And then all of a sudden, my brain will say, remember, Sherry just passed away. And I'm like, oh, gosh. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting how different people grieve in different ways. Uh, When Natalie died, I just wanted to talk about her. I just and so many people felt so uncomfortable around me. They just wanted to, you know, give me their condolences and move on. And I just wanted to sit there and talk about her, Mm -hmm. you know, and why I cared about her so much and all the different things. And now, honestly, our, our sister, I'm, I'm more estranged from her than I was from our cousin. Um, so it's kind of different. It's a little different being estranged from someone and then they pass away. Um, it's still sad. Um, but it doesn't, you know, impact my life as much as when someone you're close to that you're in contact with all the time. So that's been different for me on this one. Right. Well, and also though, in a way that makes it a little more difficult because you now do not have the opportunity to mend fences. Right. It's gone. It's interesting. I've talked to other um, friends who are in the same, same situation. I talked to two friends from church recently who both lost siblings not long ago, both of them were had kind of mixed relationships with those sibs. And I said, let's talk. And we both, you know, we all agreed that it's it's just hard to lose a sibling. And in a way, it's hard when you're not on best terms with someone when they die because you you feel like I could never go back and do anything to change that relationship now. Not until the next life, anyway. Yeah. And, um, I just tell myself that she and she totally has a total understanding now. And um, I don't think she has any ill feelings for any of us. And um, I mean, Sherry had had a great sense of humor. And I think mm-hmm. she thought it was like, Psh, whatever, guys, whatever, everything's cool. You know? <laughs> so anyway, it's an interesting time. And we're probably going to be going out to services in Arizona next week that was the other thing it's like when do you do a memorial when christmas is right around the corner and because you don't want to put it right in the front of christmas but it's got to go somewhere and so i guess it's going to be between christmas and new year's um and so making a, a kind of pilgrimage back to our old stomping grounds 
in Arizona. And um, so uh, that'll be good. Um, the day that this show is airing is Thursday here in Denver. I'm pre-recording, but we're expecting like a high of negative two. <laughs> oh, wow. I've heard, um, I've heard that, that negative 12, uh, somebody sent me a screenshot of negative 12 in Denver for the high. Mm -hmm. And as, I mean, as opposed to the suburbs, but I don't, it's going to be like the coldest day in 32 years or something. So if you're listening <laughs> to this on Thursday, uh, I hope that you are all bundled up inside somewhere and not having to go outside for any reason, because uh, it's really not worth it. <laughs> So uh, you and your family are coming out here. Are you coming out during the cold day? Or are you going to wait? <laughs> uh, well, that's the big worry right now. They say that it's going to get, if we're in Wyoming, um, and the, they say it's going to be negative 30 here. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah. And so they're, we're already being advised not to travel until Friday. So that'll um, yeah, just throw us off a day. It'll be fine. But yeah, I mean, my biggest worry would be, you know, losing power that kind yeah. of thing. That's what happened to us, you know, a while back in Texas, we had this huge, I think it was last year, this huge freeze over and lots of people lost their electricity. And so you know, people were dying even. So that would be my biggest fear, but. Yeah, it's crazy. I, okay. I have that same concern. So it's a good time to make sure that you have blankets, lots of blankets, candles, flashlights. Uh, you know, you've got enough food in the house and I, I i think if it does go out it won't be long term but you got to make sure you have enough i mean i heard that in texas there was an 11 year old boy that froze to death inside his house I yep think, how can that happen how is that kid not bundled up is there not a I, I don't think his parents were home but did he not realize that he was that cold or it's just strange so yeah People make sure that you have plenty of blankets and use body heat, um, you know, get next to whoever's in the same house with you. Don't freeze if you're, if the uh, electricity goes out, but let's pray it doesn't. So, so you wrote this song, Christmas in Cloud City, and made this fabulous video that you can find on YouTube. So if you want- oh, Do you call it fabulous because you're in it? Yes, of course. Why? <laughs> <laughs> That was fun to make. So listeners, if you want to see Jane as Princess Leia and I'm in there as what's my what's my character? It's a guard. A, yeah, an imperial guard. Imperial, right? officer. There imperial you go. officer. Imperial officer. Imperial officer. Yeah. Female imperial officer. And um you can go to YouTube and find it. It's Christmas in Cloud City. And um what the one of the funny things about that outfit that I was wearing, it that and then I have a police officer. I also now have an FBI. I don't know what it is with all this law enforcement, but um, <laughs> I was one at one time I was dating a, a libertarian and, you know, libertarians are really not big fans of law enforcement for obvious reasons. And, but he wanted to see me in <laughs> that officer outfit and the police. I said, do you, you do realize that's a little ironic, don't you? And he said, oh yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know if it's mm. all men that like to see women in a position of power uniform or if it was just his little quirk. But um I, I wager lots of men like it. <laughs> I'd say men like it when women dress up, period. Especially if it's, you know, a little provocative. So men, if you are listening and you're single, um, <laughs> and you want to weigh in on this, send me an email at Annette at AnnetteTalks.com or go to AnnetteTalks.com and you can fill out a little email um, form there. And tell me, do you like it when women are dressed as law enforcement types? <laughs> <Is that attractive? laughs> I did get an email from a listener recently um, asking me about my last show and telling me, you forgot to tell me where this, where that quote came from. And I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry. But at least that means somebody's listening, right? <laughs> so, um, I am going to play the song for those of you that are listening in a little bit. Um, but you had another song uh, with the video on YouTube, If I Could Be Princess Leia. Yeah, that was the first one. So I wrote that for my husband's 30th birthday because he's very into Star Wars and I've always liked Star Wars. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun to write him a song? So I wrote this Princess Leia song. Years later, I thought, well, let's make a video 
and oh, he got into it, you know? And, and then I realized, oh, if I want my husband to be into this, and if I want him to pay for this expensive hobby of mine, I got to keep it Star Wars themed. And then I thought, oh, Christmas, you know, that's something I can pull out every year. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so I thought, let's do a Christmas, let's do a Christmas song. And from there, I thought, what else could I possibly do for Star Wars? And then the Mandalorian came out. Of course, we loved that show. Mm -hmm. And so then I wrote the Mandalorian song. So those are my three Star Wars songs. I think it'd be great if I could come up with another idea for a Star Wars song. But as of right now, I fresh out of ideas, but I've got those three Star Wars songs. And if you go to your Alexa and say, play music um, by Jane Greaves, four songs will play for you. Three of them will be Star Wars songs. Awesome. And you're also obviously the videos are on YouTube and the songs can be purchased on Amazon. Yep. Okay. So, um, well, you know, one idea you could do a song about how baby Grogu and um, uh, Yoda work. Are those the same person? They're not the same person. They're one, you know, <laughs> what do you think about that. Hmm. I think that would be fun. All oh, right. I'll, I'll think about that. Okay. You do that. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and play your song and then we will continue talking. Okay. All righty. Here we go. This is going to be super, super high tech fancy. I want Christmas in Cloud City. New Year's in Naboo After Halloween on Tatooine I want to share my Christmas with all of you So Merry Christmas with each and every one of you Hard place Santa Well Chewie Oh, 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 
start it again. All right. <laughs> That's what happens when you're doing this without a producer. Anyway, um, so that was excellent. Um, when I was when I was on YouTube just now, um, looking at that, that one just had a picture, just had an image, didn't have your video. Oh, right. There's that too. You have a couple of them. So it's a couple of different ones like that. Yeah. Cause I, I send my songs out through CD baby and CD baby just sends my songs out to all, all oh. different platforms. I don't even know where all of my music is. Oh, CD. Baby. Yeah. And that's why I was surprised that my music was, I could hear it on Alexa. <laughs> I was like, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I set it up right somewhere. We um we play it on Alexa over here, um just for kicks. Uh, Amanda still says that you sound like Blondie. Oh, nice! Every time she hears it. So, so you have four songs, three that are Star Wars that are out there right now. And, yep. Um, what do you have uh, planned for your future? You know, right now I'm just, I have some old songs that the recordings aren't that great. I mean, I'm talking decades old. So um, that I'm going to re-record. I mean, it's expensive, you know, I'm not making any money on this yet. So um, it's a couple thousand dollars per song wow. from start to finish, if not more, depending on how much you spend, you know, making the video and the editing and all that kind of stuff. But just the song itself, that's a couple grand right there for oh. going into recording studios. You have someone put down tracks for you and it's, it's a process and it's, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, hopefully you'll come up with something else. Um, uh, we should warn people that if they're going to watch that video, that it's, um, kind of rated PG 13. Cause there's that. Oh. The makeout scenes. <laughs> hey, it's New Year's on Naboo. <laughs> People are making out. Is it is it da broad daylight in Naboo twenty four seven? <laughs> Maybe so. I don't know. It was it's broad daylight in that scene, and uh, <laughs> you're only supposed to kiss at midnight. Well, you know, don't you hate it when you watch shows or movies where it's just so dark you don't know what's going on? Yes. We wanted to make sure you could see what was going on. Oh, we really appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> wow. PG-13 <laughs> so I'm talking with Jane Greaves I forgot to mention your name again earlier and mm. you can find Jane Greaves on YouTube and Alexa and probably all the other podcast um, platforms I'm just guessing um, yeah. where mp3s or songs go other than podcasts where do they go Um, I don't know did you just do a, oh, do a like search Spotify or um, Apple. Music? Yeah. yeah, I think I like I like I said, I think CD Babies sh shares them everywhere. Yeah. Like yeah. I can kind of click and say, oh, I want them sent everywhere. And That's some places are you, are free and some places you'd have to pay for, to hear my music. Ah, all right. Well, that's like Libsyn. That's how I do my podcast. And it's okay. just to every place at one time. And so um, it, you may be listening to this podcast um, through Spotify. Um, as long as we're talking about that, I'm going to go ahead and plug myself. Um, if you haven't joined me yet, find me on Facebook, Annette Bybee, and follow me. And then come to find my radio show group. I usually do a poll every day. Um, I haven't done one for a few days this week. I'm kind of just letting Christmas be Christmas. Um, but I usually do a political poll every day. And um, you can also go to my website, AnnetteTalks.com, and listen live to my radio show. I'm on Thursdays at 1 o'clock, and then the, it replays Sunday nights at 9. And so you can find me um, those places. Also, if you have a fabulous uh, business that puts out services or um, sells stuff, and it's a really great business and you like what I'm doing on this show. Um, I'm usually conservative talk radio when I'm not doing Christmas. So if you like that um, and you want to advertise on my show, I am accepting advertisers right now. And you can find me um, again, go to AnnetteTalks.com and fill out the form or send me an email at Annette at AnnetteTalks.com. All right. So for the last few minutes of the show, I wanted to tell the story of the Christmas truce of 1914, because this is a really cool story. 
And I got this off of, um, oh, which website is it? FEE Daily, since my listeners want to know. <laughs> okay. The story of the Christmas truce of 1914 and its eternal message. Even enemies can become friends when we reject violence and see people as they truly are as individuals. The British and German troops who on Christmas Eve enjoyed a night of joy amid the carnage of 1914 could attest to that. And if you haven't studied World War I, uh, I recommend it. it was, that was a really difficult war. Uh, lots of trench warfare. Anyway, here we go. War had already been waging in Europe for months when Pope Benedict issued a plea from Rome on December 7th, 1914 to leaders of Europe, declare a Christmas truce. Benedict saw how badly peace was needed, even if it was only for a day. The first battle of, I think it's Ypres, alone fought from October 19th to November 22nd had resulted in some 200,000 casualties, mostly German and French soldiers, but also thousands of English and Belgians. The first battle of the Marne was even worse. In light of this carnage, the Pope asked that the guns may fall silent at least upon the night the angels sing, sang. The European leaders ignored his plea. Then something miraculous happened on the eve of Christmas. From no man's land, the area between the trench works of allied and central forces, German troops in a spontaneous act put down their weapons and invited English soldiers to celebrate Christmas with them. It's remembered today as the Christmas truce. The British cartoonist Bruce Barron's father was one of many who chronicled the event. A machine gunner in the 1st Battalion of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, Barron's, Barron's father was shivering in the muck of a three-foot trench on a cold night munching on stale biscuits and chain smoking when he heard a noise at about 10 p.m. I listened, he recalled. Away across the field, among the dark shadows beyond, I could hear the murmur of voices. He turned to a fellow soldier in his trench and said, do you hear the boches, which is Germans, kicking up that racket over there? Yes, came the reply. They've been at it some time. The Germans were singing carols as it was Christmas Eve. In the darkness, some of the British soldiers began to sing back. Suddenly, Baron's father recalled, we heard a confused shouting from the other side. We all stopped to listen. The shout came again. The voice was from an enemy soldier speaking in English with a strong German accent. He was saying, come over here. After some back and forth talk, British troops laid down their weapons, climbed out of their trenches, crossed the barbed wire and joined the Germans. They traded handshakes and songs. They chewed tobacco and drank wine and laughed together. These men who earlier that day had been doing their best to kill each other. Some accounts describe German and British soldiers playing football, soccer, on makeshift fields. Others mention British soldiers setting up barber shops and offering haircuts in exchange for cigarettes. The one thing all the accounts have in common is a general feeling of merriment among the soldiers. There was not an atom of hate on either side, Baron's father recalled. Afterwards, not everyone was pleased with the gaiety. Some military leaders reportedly seethed over the Christmas truce. But Baron's father suggests the soldiers themselves cherished the moment which they sorely needed. For those who participated, it was surely a welcome break from the hell they had been enduring. When the war had begun just six months earlier, most soldiers figured it would be over quickly and they'd be home with their families in time for the holidays. Not only would the war drag on for more four more years, but it would prove to be the bloodiest conflict ever up to that time. I've always found the Christmas truce moving and also telling. While the leaders of Europe may have loathed one another, the German and English people clearly did not, at least not once they met one another. On that Christmas night, the nationalism that had divided German and British soldiers evaporated when they met face to face, traded, laughed, drank, and discovered their common humanity. So I really like that story. I think that's awesome that um, even in the midst of war, that two um, enemy uh, sides can decide uh, the spirit of Christmas is stronger than this. Let's let's reach out and embrace each other, if, even for just a few hours. So any comments, any parting comments, Jane? Nope. <laughs> no, I was actually, I was actually hoping, uh, in that story they were going to come together and sing songs or something okay. <laughs> there was going to be song songs at the beginning but they didn't um oh. 
it sounds like they were spent they spent uh, several hours just kind of hanging out and like acting like normal human beings not fighting each other so oh, that's nice yeah it's yeah it's too bad the war kept going for four years but it does illustrate that when people decide to do something they can go ahead and do it so yeah all right. Thank you, Jane Greaves, for joining us. And um, everyone, you can find Jane again on YouTube or Spotify or Amazon Music or any of those other places. So Merry Christmas, Jane, and I'll see you here in a few days. Merry Christmas, Annette. <laughs> see you later. Uh, listeners, we'll be right back. All right. Welcome back to Annette on America. This is Annette Bybee. And um, if you missed the first half, go back to AnnetteTalks.com and find it. Um, I was chatting with um, a singer songwriter about her Christmas song. And I'm continuing with that theme because here we are just a few days away from Christmas. And I thought it would be fun to take a break from politics for just a week and um, talk about some Christmas music and Christmas in general. So next up, I have country artist Clayton Smalley, who is the epitome of Merle Haggard's working man blues. Other than the nine kids Merle references, the, songs, the song could be the Spanish Fork, Utah-based singer-songwriter's autobiography. A welder by trade, Clayton, a blue collar family man is a throwback to when artists balance the responsibilities of working helping provide for a family and pursuing a passion for music. Born and raised in Southern California, Clayton grew up listening to artists like George Strait, Keith Whitley and Reba McIntyre, which galvanized his love of traditional country music and helped define his own style. Outside of music, you can find Clayton fishing the lakes of Utah for rainbow and cutthroat trout or hunting in the Nebo mountains. Clayton recently performed at the Rocky Mountain Country Music Awards where he was nominated for new artist of the year. Hello, Clayton. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. All right. So um, you were raised in Southern California? I was. Yeah. San, what part? San Jacinto. It was uh, Riverside County. Probably the closest town people would know is Temecula, maybe. It's gotten pretty yeah, big. I know yeah. Kind of between San Diego and L.A. Right. So, um, so you're not a country boy as far as like being uh, raised in the South or anything like that. Not a Southern country boy, but like when I was growing up, that town was definitely all agriculture. Like our house was literally in the middle of an alfalfa field. Like it was, we were on farmland and oh, okay, yeah, it was, no, it was, it was definitely way more rural than it is now. <laughs> oh Yeah. Uh, I went to law school out um, not far from there, Inland Empire, yep. and I did a um, internship in Riverside, and okay. um, yeah, it looks co totally different. I grew up in Southern California as well. It's been a long time. Where at? Well, I was born in San Gabriel, and then um, lived in LA and San Diego. Okay. And so yeah, those are my old stomping grounds too. Gotcha. How long have you lived in Utah? I've been in Utah since 2014. So yeah. are you acclimated to the snow? Uh, I am now. Actually, I actually love the snow. Like my, the worst, the worst part about the winter for me is when it's clear, really cold and really windy. That's the only bad thing about out here. When it's snowing, it's usually relatively warm. It's nice. It's quiet. It's beautiful. <laughs> I, 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 I enjoy the snow. Are you getting the cold snap that they're uh, predicting for us here in Denver? Uh, I haven't seen, but yeah, like I, yesterday morning, I had a concrete pour at three o'clock in the morning and it was six degrees and windy. Oh. So it was not fun. <laughs> wow. So you were, you were laying concrete? I, I'm, I'm an inspector now. So I was just looking, checking the rebar and then making sure they were doing everything the way they're supposed to. 
All right, so you're you're doing inspections now. Are you still welding? No, I mean I do on the side, but yeah, no, that was that's just my background. That's what I grew up doing, and my first certificate or thing that I shot for was a welding inspector, and that's a big part of my job now. But I've kind of added all this other stuff to kind of make sure I stay busy. <laughs> so you are you then in the middle of um, trying to build your country music? career is your hope is to like cross that bridge into just singing country music for a living yeah I mean my hope is to do whatever it'll do like I've always loved singing um I just never had the time like <clears throat> I did it when I was younger had a band you know before I got married and had kids but then I got married and had kids and next thing I know I'm coaching baseball for 15 years and <laughs> you know it just life gets in the way and then they all went to high school and I didn't have those same, you know, time restraints and just started getting back into it and got another band going and posting videos on YouTube. And next thing I know, I've got, you know, uh, John Griffin, who's my regular co-writer is a co-owner of an independent record label. And he messaged me and was like, Hey, you want to write your own songs and put them out? We'll help you. And all we got to do is split whatever the music makes, you know, and, that's kind of how it started. And I've always been a huge fan of great songs. So like wherever this takes me, I'm always going to write songs and always going to try to write really good songs and, you know, strive to get better at that. And who knows, maybe someday I'll become a hit songwriter. I don't know. <laughs> so how did John Griffin find you? Uh, I actually followed him on Instagram. I think when I, when I, so the way it kind of rolled out was I wanted to get a band going again. I wanted to start kind of developing a following because I was in a totally different place. And so I, my first thing I did was start a YouTube channel. So I'd start doing covers and um, kind of the, the back, the main foundation for that was that I wanted to get my guitar chops back because I hadn't played guitar in a while. Like I was raising kids and doing all that. So um I just wanted to start getting back into playing and singing and kind of building up a set list for like, if I could get a band together, you know, but I knew <clears throat> I'm kind of, I'll bounce around a little bit. So I knew if I, if I was going to set up a channel, I'd have to learn a song, like start to finish. Otherwise I'd start a song and then I'd hear a song on the radio and go, Oh, I need to learn that one. And I'd go start working on that one and never finish one, you know? So th that was kind of my own, like structure to make sure I'd sit down and, and learn them. And so then I started Instagram and Facebook and just kind of started following people that were, you know, into music. And he just came up as a suggestion and I followed him and he messaged me back. He's like, Hey, how'd you find me? I was like, you were a suggestion. And he started checking out my stuff and just kind of went from there. Huh. That it's a funny time that we live in now, isn't it? Where oh, yeah. we put ourselves out there yep. um, on YouTube and Instagram and Spotify and every every place else. That wasn't something that we had as an option growing up. Nope. Like that's totally different. And um, it's it's good and bad, right? I mean, it's good in that you have an instant platform. It's bad in that you have an instant platform. So like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like I had, a, I started with a podcast before the radio show, and um, at first that was impressive. But now everyone that hears it, oh, I've got a podcast too, right? Or, or I get someone <laughs> reaching out to me. How do I start a podcast? Um, it's really easy. Like probably you have a brother or a cousin that's doing it, right? Because everybody's <laughs> doing it. So you have to find a way to stand out. Yeah. Right. So obviously you must have done something that made you stand out um, for John Griffin to notice you. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I've always, I've, I've, I've always loved singing and um, that's probably my, my best attribute. I'm definitely not a good guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to be playing your Christmas song, bringing Christmas to life. Um, and now, did you did you write this song, or did you co-write it with someone? Uh, I co-wrote it with John Griffin, who I've co-written co most of my stuff with, as well as for the last year and a half or so, uh, we've been writing with my producer, who 
out in Nashville that like puts out all my music and uh, we've been having a good time and writing some pretty good stuff. David Flint um, used to play for Highway 20, uh, Highway 21. Okay. So yeah. I have to admit that I'm pretty um, ignorant when it comes to country music. Oh, that's all good. I, like, I grew up with it too. I grew up in a small, smallish farm town in Arizona, Yuma. You probably okay. heard it. And um, so a lot of my friends listen to it. So, I mean, obviously I know who George Strait and Reba McIntyre are. I don't know who Keith Whitley is. So don't, don't hate on me, people, if you're listening. Um, I have a lot of listeners that I'm sure are country music fans because um, it tends to go together with conservative values. So um, <laughs> you should definitely go check out Keith Whitley. All right. And I, I just had a, I just realized he played for Highway 101. Okay. Uh, cool band from back in the, I think, I want to say like 70s, 80s. Oh, all right. But, That's my yeah. time period, but not my genre. <laughs> gotcha. Like I, I can name all the 80s music, um, uh, but not most of the country music. Okay. Except for uh, a few, you know, actually Friends in Low Places. I don't know when, when that one came out, but. Um, I think that was know. early 90s. Okay. So I know that one. <laughs> and what's it is it neon moon is that also george Strait? i mean no that's um, brooks and brooks and dunn okay brooks and dunn right garth yeah. brooks right okay so that song um takes me back and i know that all right anyway that's I'm a just, good one <laughs> yeah it is a good one and i hear that one still and it takes me back to like old dances church dances and stuff oh yeah anyway um, I want you to tell us what was the inspiration behind this bringing Christmas to life and um, is it, do you relate to the story in it and the lyrics? Oh, I definitely relate to it. <laughs> so we sat down, we knew we were going to write a Christmas song that day. And I just, I, I love all the traditional Christmas music, but I, we just started talking like, what's your, like, what's, so we'll just start talking to each other. Like what's your routine? And I just kind of started talking about, well, usually it's literally the day after Thanksgiving. I'm still in a Turkey coma. And my wife's telling me, you got to go get all the bins down with all the decorations. Like I'm, I'm not ready to start doing it yet, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's, it's literally the next morning. She's ready to start decorating. She's ready to start clearing out a place for the tree. We literally go get the Christmas tree on Friday after Thanksgiving Mm -hmm. And it's just up front a lot of work for me and I'm not really in the Christmas spirit yet. So that's kind of how it just kind of rolled out was because the day after Thanksgiving, I'm definitely not in the Christmas mood yet. But as I start putting in, you know, help her get everything out and she starts going around and decorating and making everything pretty, I slowly start, you know, she starts baking, she starts playing music. She wants to watch all the Christmas movies and like, slowly but surely I'm getting into the Christmas mood, you know? And then it's as you, I mean, like everybody knows as you get older, time flies by. It's like next thing you know, like Christmas is on Sunday and mm -hmm. that's kind of crazy to me. Yeah. Then, I know. You know. It, felt like it, it, it feels like the Christmas season is now goes for like two months, you know, yeah. but then when you get into the week of, here we are. Yeah, it's already coming in five days and it feels really, really quick. Yeah. So um, I also find that Christmas music um, is very healing. Um, I Before you and I talked, my sister was on and we both lost a sister last week. And, oh, wow. uh, and yeah, and I thought, gosh, this is really hard. And then um, I went to church on Sunday and we were singing, you know, Christmas songs, Christmas carols. And it really helped a lot. And so I can see why people um, have a hard time at Christmas because you, we lose people and it's a difficult time because it seems like everybody else is happy when you're not. But Christmas songs to me are just very powerful and um, hopeful and healing. So yeah. um, it's, it's one of the positives about, I guess, it, when something horrible happens around Christmas, if you can focus on the music. All right, yeah. well, I'm going to go ahead and play your song. So I am sitting here with Clayton Smalley, and we are going to play his Christmas song, Bringing Christmas to Life. 
And where can people find this song if they want to download it, buy it, listen to it? It's everywhere. Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, uh, YouTube, everywhere you download and stream music. All right. All right, here we go. I am going to now start playing this. I'm up in the attic Dusting off familiar old bins Thanksgiving's over Here we go again I'll be unpacking these decorations all night Doing my part Bringing Christmas to life My wife and the kids Have cleared out a place for the tree They're ready to go pick one out Just waiting on I'm in the front yard Untangling strands of lies We're doing our part Bringing Christmas to life We go through the motions Of setting the scene Reminiscing while making new memories Between cookies and carols and hanging the star The spirit of Christmas finds its way to our hearts Reminiscing while making new memories Between cookies and carols and hanging the star The spirit of Christmas finds its way to our hearts The kids are in bed after leaving the living room trash Sad to believe another Christmas has passed I'll be back in the attic unpacking in the blink of an eye Doing my part, bringing Christmas to life We're doing our part, bringing Christmas to all right. I feel like a DJ, a music DJ right now. That <laughs> bringing Christmas to life by Clayton Smalley. <laughs> well, that's a that's a very fine song. Um, it, it, it's. I almost feel like it should be called like warming up to Christmas. Like, yeah. <laughs> I guess, it's like, all right, I guess if I have to do this, I can get, I can do this and get it done. Well, that's really nice. I like it. Thanks. So, um, so you live up in Utah and you're married and you have kids. How many kids do you have? Two. And how old? Uh, are you? Boy and a girl. My son just turned 18. My daughter's. 21 just moved oh, okay. out a few months ago she's a nurse up at primary children's hospital in salt lake and uh my son's still trying to figure out what he wants to do <laughs> do either of them uh play music or sing music like you do they don't no, no. <laughs> nobody's musical in your family besides you you're it i've got a couple uh 
nieces that are interested in it. I don't, it's a weird thing. Cause like, I think I got, I think I got singing from my grandma and, uh, and my great grandpa. So on my dad's side and my mom's side, but that's like literally the closest for anybody that's done music. And yeah, I don't know. I've, I've been singing since I was like, <clears throat> we used to like go ride up in big ride horses up in big bear when i was like knee high and my mom would make me sing to make sure i stayed awake on the horse because i'd fall <laughs> off every now and then <laughs> oh, a country singer on a horse gosh who would have ever thought that could be a thing <laughs> so when you were when you were in high school and you had your band did you dream of being a big country singer someday? oh yeah for sure yeah my plan was i was going to nashville yeah, from the get go, that was what. Yeah, that was my goal. Like that back then, like Garth Brooks was at his height, and you know, like I, I remember doing a talent show for the high school where I sang the dance, and yeah, that was definitely the goal. And you know, sometimes life just gets in the way. I didn't want to. I I I could have still done it. But like I grew up, my dad was a truck driver. And so him and my mom divorced when I was like really young, he was never around. So it was like really important to me when I had kids that like, like being on the road, playing music was not an option for me. And for the way I wanted to raise my kids. But now your wife would be totally fine with that. huh? (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Oh, don't you have a concert somewhere? <laughs> yeah, get out of here. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, I, I admire the fact that you've come circled back around and you're now pursuing it. You're still a young guy. There's no reason. And even if you weren't, like, I'm a big proponent of pursuing your dreams. Like, I yeah. really don't think anyone should go through life without going for it in some way, you know? Yeah. Like I, I'm doing the crazy stuff myself now. My, I have three daughters at home that are 13, 14, and almost 12. And um, they, they don't know what I'm doing. They don't understand what I'm doing. Um, trying to break into broadcasting and become a broadcaster full time. But that's awesome. I, I, I cannot, I do not want to be like 85, 90, about to keel and say, why did I not at least try? Right. Yep. Yeah. The worst at the end thing. of your life, being I wish I'd at least gave it a shot. Yeah. You know? I mean, I would rather give it my everything and fail miserably yeah. than to look back and never have tried. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So I think it's awesome that you're doing that. Well, thanks. So you um, you were nominated for the Rocky Mountain Country Music Award, New Artist of the Year. I was. And so when are they awarding that in February? I thought I read that somewhere. No, it was this last February. Oh, yeah. they already did it. So you were nominated, yep. but you didn't win it is what yeah. happened. So, but yep. being nominated itself is pretty impressive. No, it was, yeah, that was crazy. Like it was to go, I got to go out to Greeley and play in front of a pretty big crowd. You know, back then my new song was his guitar, a song about, I was telling you about my great grandpa, my grandma handed me down his 1935 Gibsons. So we wrote a song about that. And I got to play that in front of everybody. It was, it was cool. It was a lot of fun. That's awesome. And, and probably gave you a lot of exposure, which is helpful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, have you made a few albums now? I have. We, uh, I got two EPs out. I released one in 2019. It's called Whiskey Sunrise. I wrote that mostly with John Griffin um, and then uh, Dirt Road Therapy is my other EP. And I wrote that with John Griffin and uh, hit country songwriter, Steve Dean. He's got six number ones. He wrote Roundabout Way for George Strait and um, Walk On for Reba McIntyre, Southern Star by Alabama. He's got a bunch of bunch of songs out there that have been cut and yeah it was cool to meet a guy that's been crushing it and is one of the nicest guys you've ever met in the world that is awesome 
Yeah. So, um, are you touring, or have you toured, or? Yeah, we you? did. But this is kind of a slow time of the year. We we did pretty good this summer. We were we played all over Utah, played in Montana, played in Wyoming. Uh, but yeah, right now it's kind of slowing down a little bit. <laughs> So you're doing be like the big tour and like everybody else it's more like you book your shows and go out and play forever wants to listen so are you um gonna tour again in january or what it'll be probably that? more like spring yeah okay when they when all like the festivals start kicking off and stuff it's most of the shows i'll play every now and then i'll get an opening slot for somebody but um yeah, like spring, summertime is when we're really cranking. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in the meantime, you're doing inspections and um, writing more music and that kind Making of thing? Making a living and writing over Zoom just like this. <laughs> that's what the other thing. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, that's like we were talking about the internet. It's like I'm writing with guys in Nashville a couple times a week just over the computer. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. That that's awesome. Um, so, are your does your what does your wife think about this whole thing? She, I mean, she's one hundred percent supportive of supportive of me. She's like, we she knew me back when I had my first band. Like, it yeah, it was probably like right before we pulled the plug on that is when we started dating. But she like I used to do karaoke all the time and. <laughs> yeah she's been around like we've been together for 25 or six years we've been married wow. for 22 awesome but well, no she just, yeah she she's she's backing me up she she loves coming to the shows and selling my merch that's a joke. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> you need that you need to camp and help you that's awesome <laughs> All right. Well, we are now out of time. Um, but where can people find you? Have a website? I do. ClaytonSmalleyMusic.com. And then all the social medias are Clayton Smalley Country. All right. ClaytonSmalleyMusic.com or Clayton Smalley Country. And obviously your music can be found in all the places that you named earlier, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. All right, everyone, go and find Bringing Christmas to Life by Clayton Smalley and play it for your house and and share it with your friends and family and um, enjoy some good, good old Christmas country music. It's awesome. All right. Thank you, Clayton, for showing up on the show here. And um, I wish you a Merry Christmas. Thank you so much for having me on and Merry Christmas to you too. You're welcome. All right, listeners. Thank you for listening to Annette on America where freedom lovers gather. <laughs>